<laughs> amen. 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 Oh, peace. Thank you. It's him. <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> 43 years ago today, <laughs> I wasn't standing behind a pulpit. <clears throat> I was standing in front of a little white casket where we buried our daughter exactly 43 years ago today. <clears throat> I look at that as the birth of this ministry because that's, I was already searching healing, but that's whenever I got serious, you might say, because <clears throat> when you bury a child, it changes things. <clears throat> I wasn't looking for religion. I wasn't looking for rituals. I wasn't looking for a camp to be a part of. I wasn't looking for formulas, per se. I was looking for truth. I knew God had power. I knew he healed. I knew he delivered. He had healed and delivered me as a child. We just didn't know how to get it done. We were learning, and we were learning good stuff. It just didn't work fast enough. And when we buried her that day, I stood there with my wife, watched that little white casket go into the ground, and I made a vow to God because I had tried to get a hold of people and couldn't. I understand now much better than I did then. But I told God, I said, Father, if you will teach me the truth about your power and healing. There wasn't a man for me when I needed one, but if you will teach me that truth, I will be that man for somebody else so they don't have to have a grave. And I've spent the last 40 years keeping that vow. We have seen God do amazing things. We have had some great victories. We've had some heartbreaking failures. What I found out is that the failure was always on me. It was never on God. It was something I didn't know, something I didn't walk in. It wasn't on the sick person's part. When God gave us our children, he, um, we, we had battles with some of our children in the sense of the devil tried to steal their lives and we had to learn how to fight. And when we had to learn how to fight, I learned that these, for instance, my children, God gave my children to me. He didn't give them to a doctor. And so I kept handing them over to doctors. And the first time I did, we buried her. And I realized that God didn't give my children to doctors. He gave them to me. And I had to take responsibility for their total well-being. And so we took that very seriously. We made, again, certain commitments. I told God, I don't care where I find your truth, but I want your truth. Amen. I'll be honest with you. My mother-in-law was a Jehovah's Witness at the time. She had all her stuff, and she was constantly telling me her stuff. And honestly, if there had been truth in what she said, that's where I'd be today. But I proved that the stuff that she was sharing wasn't true. And I kept searching, and honestly, I didn't care where I found it, but I knew that the heart of it was in the Bible. I just didn't find a lot of people that believed the Bible. They believed parts of it. In... Uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse 19, he tells us, he said, Behold, I give unto you power, exousia, authority, to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power, ability of the enemy. And nothing, nothing. shall by any means hurt you. Amen. I have found very few Christians that actually believe that verse. Because nothing, as our sister said earlier, all means all. 
No means no. Nothing means nothing. Let me tell you something. You can only get chased if you run. If you don't run, the devil can't chase you. He'll face you until you submit yourself to God and resist the devil. And he will flee. I tried that. It didn't. mm -mm. No. Let God be true and every man a liar. You don't try the Bible. You do the Bible. And you keep doing it until you see the results it promises. Because until then, if you stop before then, your faith is small and it stopped. Faith always gets what it goes for. Now, we're going to share some things that we had, that I told him I was going to share, okay? But I'm also going to share before that a thing or two that the Lord was ministering to me as I was standing there doing the worship. So we're just going to do this and see how it goes because it definitely wasn't planned. But let's go to Luke chapter 4 real quick. Luke chapter 4. Now, and I'm going to give the Holy Spirit time to work. What that means is I'm going to be reading some scripture, but at the same time, I'm doing this on purpose because I'm going to say something, then I'm going to read the scripture. And when I'm reading scripture, the Holy Spirit's going to be working on some of you about what I said because this is what he told me to say before I read the scripture. So, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you. Now, this is, please, honor the Holy Spirit and just do exactly what he asked. Okay? We're going to minister to people, but please, if this does not apply to you, please do not respond to it. Please respond to the actual thing that we're going to talk about for just this moment. We'll get to the rest of you. But let's just do what the Holy Spirit does. Amen? So, there is several, I would even almost want to say many, but this is twofold. Number one, I'm not sure what to say first, but we'll we'll just do it this way because they may even be connected. May be connected. You've lost a child. You've tried to get over it. You've tried to move on like people told you. But it's just stuck. And it's hurt. And you hurt. And every day you try to keep going, but it, it just wells up on you. Because you, it's like you can't get past it. And you've asked God, God, do something. Fix this. Because you're moving from mourning over into grief. And it's okay to mourn. But if you let it stick too long, you'll turn into grief. And then that spirit gets a hold of you. So if you, number one, if you've lost a child and it has stuck to that point where you can't seem to shake it, come down front real quick. This isn't a 10, 15 minute call. This is now, right now. Come quick. Second thing, you have been betrayed by a father and you just can't trust men at all. It's stuck. You've tried. You try to get past it. You just can't do it. I'm here to tell you, your father is saying, come. You have a father that loves you. He will never betray you. He will never hurt you. He is sad that you were betrayed by a father. But if that is you, come down front quickly, quickly, quickly. 
He wants to show you his love. The first step of him showing you his love is the fact that he is telling you to come. Because we could be doing other stuff. But he doesn't just heal physical bodies. He heals hearts, minds. He heals hurts, he heals pains. And we're just gonna, you coming down has already started that healing. It's opened you up so that you can receive that because he, he wants you to be free. Free of the pain, free of the betrayal, free of the idea of betrayal. He wants you to be free to really worship him because it's even hindered you in your walk with him because you know he's father. And when you hear father, it doesn't have the same ring as it should. So I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father, for this day. That by your spirit right now, you have touched, even now as we speak, by the Holy Spirit, you're touching these lives, fixing and changing that this is a new day. So, Father, I thank you even now. And we release your spirit in your life. We release your peace. Father, you said that we can release our peace into houses and we can release our peace into hearts. Father, I thank you for it. That it right now, now, this changes. Now is the day of your freedom. Everything changes right now. So in the name of Jesus, now listen carefully. In the name of Jesus, I'm not going to lay hands on you. I'm going to fulfill the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Luke chapter 4, he says that his ministry would include proclaiming liberty to the captives. And this is what he told me to do standing right there. He said, do this. I want you to proclaim their liberty. So in the name of Jesus right now, I speak to each and every one of you, both categories that we have called forward. And right now, I proclaim, I declare, I speak as an oracle of God. I speak right now as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. I speak as one that has the authority to proclaim and declare to you, you are free. Free in the name of Jesus. His name and his blood sets you free. The hurt, the pain, everything you've gone through ceases now. Not tomorrow, not this evening, now in the name of Jesus. Right now, I set you free. Be healed, whole, right now in the name of Jesus. So be it. So be it. Now just let that word settle in your heart. No, he's the one that spoke this. He's the one that declared it before he ever told me about it. This is his will, his desire, is that you be free and to know him. Even now, in the name of Jesus. Right now, say this with me. Father, I declare your word is true. I am free. Your gospel is the power of God. And therefore, 
That good news has set me free. The good news of Jesus Christ, of his name and his blood. And that name is above every other name. Everything else has to bow its knee now in the name of Jesus. So be it. Amen. 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 Now, now, do you believe that? Yes. Do you receive that? Yes. So say it like you believe it. I'm free. Yes. I'm free. I'm free. 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 I'm free. free. This is how you get free. It's declared and then you walk it out. And you have to decide to agree and believe it. Now, the word has already been spoken. What are you going to do with it? You're going to have to live in it, walk in it, and decide to keep it. Amen? Amen. All right, you can be seated. Amen. Now, very quickly, we're still in Luke chapter 4. And in Luke chapter 4, this is where Jesus actually said this in verse 17. Well, we can start in 16. It says, he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. This is what he began to quote. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach, proclaim the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach Proclaim deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, I'm going to read another verse. You can hang on there in Luke if you want to. You can go to Mark 16 if you want to. But these both go together. I'll show you why in just a second. It's the number one reason why people fail to be healed when people minister healing to them. In Mark 16, verse 15, and he said unto them, Go ye, go ye, not sit ye, go ye into all the world and preach, proclaim, the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, in those roughly four verses there, you can look at it in your own Bible, but I would challenge you now to find the word pray. It's not in there. Jesus never said, go pray for the sick. That's why most people don't get healed. John Lake said that his experience proved to him. Actually, I'll give you the the background real quick for it. He went to a Bible school in Lima, Ohio. They've been praying for the gifts of the Spirit, for the baptism of the Spirit for nine months. He went there. He watched them, watched how they begged and cried and did all these things. And he said, I told them that they could pray and pray and pray and they could pray for nine months and never receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost. But if they will take off their coat, roll up their sleeves, go out and give away what God has given them, he will give them more. In South Africa, he wrote a small little paragraph for a magazine back here in America. And he said, I have proven 
that you can pray and pray and pray until you actually pray yourself into unbelief. He said, but if you get up and go use what you've got, God will give you more. It's the law of sowing and reaping. Now, but here's the, here's the thing. Now, in, so in Mark chapter 16, it doesn't say pray. If you go to Luke, we were in Luke 4 just now. Jesus said that part of his ministry was to proclaim. Now, several times it said preach here. But if you look up the word preach, it actually is the word for proclaim. Now, the Bible says to be instant, in season and out. The Greek in it would actually say more along the lines of be ready in season and out of season. It says when opportunity presents itself and when it doesn't. Imagine that. What does that mean? Be instant, in season and out. Be ready when opportunity presents itself and when it doesn't. What does that mean? It means even if an opportunity isn't present, you still, what? Preach the word. See, people say, well, it wasn't convenient. So, when opportunity presents itself and when it doesn't. There are some times that you actually have to break into a situation to present the gospel because it's necessary. So, when he said that, that word proclaim there, when he said preach the word, be instant, in season and out, preach the word. That word preach is proclaim. Proclaim the word. When it's convenient, when it's not, you proclaim the word. Now, in Luke 13, go to Luke 13 real quick. Now, let me get there. There. Luke 13, verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. Now, this, uh, this King James, uh, the original Greek, goes back and literally says that her body was bent over in half to where her body touched her legs, folded in half. Why? A spirit of infirmity, 18 years. 18 years she lived like that. For 18 years, all she could see was dirty feet. Why? Because that's what the devil likes to do. He was commanded to crawl in the dust, so he tries to make people bow. He tries to get them to crawl in the dust. All she could see was sandals and dirty feet, couldn't tell who was around, didn't know these things. Why? Because she was bowed over. Now, 18 years. Here she is in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Now, apparently, we would assume, she had been there pretty much every week for 18 years. So that's 52 times 18. That's how many times she'd been in the synagogue. Came in, bowed over, walked out, bowed over. Remember that. It's going to come up again in a second. He says here, she could have no wise lift up herself, Now watch this. Now listen, we're not to put anything in here this doesn't say. Isn't that right? And we're not to take out anything that it does say. Is that right? So we're only going to believe what it says. Is that right? Okay, so let's read what it says. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him. Now King James says the her to him actually there is not in the original Greek, but the idea is there. So it said, now watch this. It says, and when he saw her, now we could read it with or without. If we read it without, it says, he called and said unto her, woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Now let's look at what's not there. Okay. He says, when he saw her, He called her to him and said unto her, okay, woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. Notice, now, what what is he doing here? Okay, I'll give you the answer. He's doing Luke chapter 4. He is proclaiming liberty to the captive. Here's what he didn't do. 
Woman, how much faith do you have? Woman, do you believe I'm anointed? Woman, uh, what caused this? What did you do? He didn't say any of this. Let me tell you what else is not written there. Let me, let me read it the way the modern Christian version would have to read it. And when Jesus was led by the Spirit and was told by the Spirit to call her to him, when the Spirit led him to minister to her. Is any of that in there? It says he saw her. He saw her bowed over. What does that mean? He sees a captive. He said, what do you mean a captive? Okay, let's read the rest of it. Now watch this. Woman, thou art loosed. He was proclaiming liberty to the captive. Notice what he didn't say. Woman, do you mind if I pray for you? Do you want me to pray for you? Do you believe I can do this? Now, he said those things. Well, he said, the, do you believe I can do this? One or two other times. He didn't say it to her. He says here, woman, thou art loosed. That's a declaration, proclamation from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Amen. Notice the glorified God came after the healing, not before. In other words, she wouldn't walk around glorifying God because she was staring at the dirt. She glorified God when God delivered her from her infirmity. Right. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. Now, I thought it was funny because it says he answered when nobody was talking to him. <laughs> but that's what religion does. The ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, now watch this, there are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed. He wasn't even talking to Jesus. Get it? Because it says there, he said unto the people. He wasn't talking to Jesus. Didn't even have the guts to confront Jesus. Goes to the people. No, 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 no. There's, there's six other days for men to work. So you come in one of those days. Now, it's funny because he says that, but this woman had been there for 18 years, six other days. And it never got done. But that's what religion will do. It'll always put it off to yesterday or tomorrow. Never today. Religion hates today. Why? Because today is the day of salvation. He says, There are six days in which men ought to work, and them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him. Oh. He wasn't even talking to the Lord, but the Lord answered him. And here's what he said. You hypocrite. Well, he wasn't used to that, I guarantee you. Not in the synagogue. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And now watch. And ought not this woman... Being a daughter of Abraham. Now watch. Whom Satan hath bound. Lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed. And all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Now notice what he says. Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham? No other reason. Not because she was special, not because she tithed, not because she did author offerings, not because anything else, but just she was a daughter of Abraham. That's it. The only reason. Shouldn't she be loosed? 
Now, and you look at this word loose, and then you look at what Jesus compared it to. He said, shouldn't she be loosed from this bondage, this bond, okay? So what we're talking about here is an actual demonstration of binding and loosing. In this situation, she was being loosed from a binding that Satan had put on her. To be loosed means to be untied. That's what the word means. Luo is a derivation of that word. And it means to be loosed, to be set free, to be unshackled, to be unchained. And he says, shouldn't this woman be loosed from this? Now watch this. From this bondage, from this bond, okay, on the Sabbath day. But now notice, who bound her? Satan. This is as simple as it can get. Now here's what I like about it. Jesus, in fulfilling his ministry, he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and I'm going to heal the brokenhearted. I'm going to preach deliverance to the captives, liberty to the captives. I'm going to, and he gave us a whole list of what he was going to do. And everything he did for the next three and a half, close to four years is right there in Luke 4, 18. It's right there. All he did, he said, here's what I'm called to do. Now I'm going to get about it. And I'm going to go do it. And I'm going to go and I'm going to do this. and I'm going to go do that. And they say, well, how do you know who or when? He's already been told to do it. He got it from the word. He found where it was written. He said this, and we, we found out that he even said, this scripture is fulfilled today in your ears. In other words, I'm here to do this. So from then on, every time he would heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, whatever it is, he was fulfilling Luke 4.18, which was brought out from Isaiah 61. And in Isaiah 61, he said he came to proclaim Liberty. It said there he was coming to proclaim the year of acceptance. And he stopped just before he got to the next part that said, and the day of the vengeance of our God. So there's a year of acceptance and a day of vengeance. Well, guess what? We're in that year of acceptance. Why? Because the day of vengeance ain't here yet. Amen? But there's coming a day. But this is a year of acceptance. Now, I wanted to show this to you because that was what, that's how Jesus ministered. This was him proclaiming liberty to the captive. This is one of the reasons why most people don't get results when they start to minister to people. It's because they'll pray and they'll ask God to do something where God didn't say to ask him to do it. And even Jesus, whenever he sent out his disciples, he was very clear. He said, you're going to go and you're going to heal the sick, cast out devils. You're going to preach the word. He said, this is what you're going to do. So it was real simple. It, it, it's not, he didn't say, now pray for the ones that want it. Pray for the ones that come to you. Ask the Lord who to go to. No, he said, preach to every creature every creature. You say, well, but how do I know which ones are ready? Does it matter? Why? Because you're either planting, watering, or harvesting. So which is it? See, we, want, we only want to go to the people we know we're going to harvest. No, you might be a planter. Right? So you go no matter what, and you don't have to pick and choose. Why? We're told not to pick and choose. He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, cleanse the leper. Freely you've received, freely give. That was not a money verse. Funny, we tie it to that a lot of times. It's kind of like, all right, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. Uh, yeah, okay, well, I, I've, you freely received this word, so now give. That ain't what he was saying. He was saying... Freely you've received. He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely I've given you this power. Now go give it away freely to anybody that needs it. You say, well, how do I know who needs it? How do I know who God wants to heal? Okay, well, let's go there real quick. Go to Luke again. And we'll go to Luke chapter 9. Who would Jesus heal? Let's see who he healed. Luke chapter 9. 
Verse 10, and, when, and the apostles, when they were returned, told him all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. And the people, when they knew it, followed him and he received them and spoke unto them of the kingdom of God and healed them that had need of healing. Notice he didn't heal them that had enough faith. He didn't heal them that it was their lucky day. He didn't heal certain people that God told him to heal and leave the others sick. He healed them that had need of healing. Amen? One of the things that the church has yet to learn as a, as a, as a body, as a whole. See, we have emphasized, you know, to, to a large degree, rightly so. We have emphasized God's greatness, his goodness, his, his fatherhood, all that is absolutely necessary. And, and the church had swung so far to one side that we needed that to get back to understanding the true nature of God. Why? Because people thought, oh, he was throwing down lightning bolts and, you know, looking for the opportunity to smash you or King James smite you. And so we had to have that pendulum swing back to the other side. But we also have to remember the overall picture because we've, in church, we've heard so much about certain things that we've left another thing out. And that other thing is very simple. It's this. There is, there are two kingdoms. There is a kingdom of darkness. And then there's the kingdom of God's dear son, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Those three are all essentially the same. So we got two kingdoms and what people have forgotten is that these two kingdoms are still at war. Now the war is over because Satan is defeated. Amen? But how many of you know, even back in World War II, the empire of Japan, the imperial uh, empire of Japan, surrendered, and yet word didn't get out to everybody. And as late as 1976, we're talking... 30 years after the war is over, there were people in Okinawa that were still being sporadically attacked by one man, one Japanese soldier that had been cut off before the surrender in 1945. He never got word that Japan surrendered. 30 years living off of the hillside, living in caves, living in places, avoiding people because his last word was, you keep fighting. So he kept fighting. They had no explanation for some of the shootings. Only thing was the shootings and things that happened and that were going on, that it was from an old gun, from old bullets. They couldn't explain it. So just because the nation of Japan had surrendered, Everybody didn't quit fighting. Satan's defeated. He is defeated. We will look down on him and say, that is what shook that? Are you kidding me? That shook nations? And we're going to be amazed at what he's not. Because I'm telling you, the church has done some of the best PR for the devil turning him into something just slightly smaller than God when there is no comparison. Jesus won, but there's still battles to fight. Why? Because his, his, well, God's enemies hadn't surrendered. Matter of fact, it even says that he is waiting until his enemies be made his footstool. And guess what else he said? In Romans chapter 16 and verse 20, he says, And the very God of peace shall bruise, crush Satan under your feet shortly. Under your feet. Hebrews tells us and Isaiah tells us that God has placed all things, or actually Psalm 8 tells us, He has placed all things under His feet. Yet we don't see all things under His feet. You say, wait, how can all things be under His feet? We don't see all things under His feet. Well, there's been a legal decree by God that all things are under his feet. But everything doesn't obey. So now our job is to make them obey 
Our job is to put our foot in the back of Satan's knee and drive him to the ground so that he has to acknowledge Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. That's our job. That's not God's job. He gave that job to us. He gave us the job of casting out devils. He gave us the job of healing the sick. He empowers us to do it. He can't give us a job he doesn't empower us to do. If he gave us a job, he gives us the power to do it. It's just that simple. But because people don't realize there is a war, they think it's all on God. God, heal me. God, do this. God, do that. God, take this demon away from me. He didn't say that. He said, that's the believer's job is to set the captives free. He said, you go everywhere, you preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out devils. He told them that in Mark 16 at the very end. That's our job. That's our our duty. And, And we've still got people out there that are bound, still got people out there that are sick. And so we, we emphasize a lot of times of us receiving our own healing, which is, I mean, it's good. I mean, obviously, uh, if you can receive it for yourself, then you can obviously give it away too. And it's always good to be able to receive it for yourself. At the same time, the church has lost the, the, the mentality that, we're in a, that we are in a kingdom that is at war against another kingdom in the sense that, and I, I say that in this sense only, that we are here to set the captives free. That's our job. So, listen, you're not going to sing your way. Now, listen carefully. There are gifts that operate. There are things that operate certain ways. People can get healed all kinds of ways. I have a list of ways. It's a list of how people got healed. Right? Laying on of hands, making mud with spit, putting in their eyes, spitting on their finger, and putting, touching their tongue. I mean, who wants that gift? Right? <laughs> Well, you might not mind it, but the person you minister it to may mind it, right? And there's all kinds of ways, with, with claws that have been handled. So there's all kinds of ways to be healed. But sometimes we, we try to look, have you ever, okay, if you have children and you've ever told them, go clean their room, and they didn't, and then later you check it and you say, you didn't clean it, and they say, well, no, but, but, but look, I, I did do this. And you say, well, that's good, but I told you to do this. How many of you know, even though they did that, they're still disobedient. And they try to use that to say, see, but I, I know I didn't do that, but I did this instead. But that's still disobedience. Is that right? So what we have to realize is that God told us through his son what to do and how to do it. And too often, we want to find another way to do it. Another way to receive it. Another way to give it. And it's simple. Follow the directions. Just do what the Bible says and you'll get Bible results. But we keep trying to come up with new ways. And and now understand, let let me give you an example. Smith Wigglesworth. Everybody, most everybody knows about him and, and some of the miracles. He was known and we even jokingly call it the Wigglesworth anointing. Which is what? That's when you get to hit people. Right? Because he was known, right, that whenever somebody would come to him with a stomach problem, then he would hear and he'd he'd say, what's up? That was his way of saying, what's up? What's going on? And the person would say, well, I have this stomach cancer. I have this. It didn't matter what it was. But if they said stomach, he would go, huh. And I heard this from Dr. Sumrall, who was with Wigglesworth. He got it firsthand. And he'd say, huh. And he would step back and rear back and gut punch them. And they were healed. Every time. It never failed. Then you've had people since then hear that story and now they want to punch people. (laughs) Or kick people or do something else, right? But you have to remember, people don't realize, they think, oh, that was the Spirit of God telling Wigglesworth to punch them. No, it wasn't. Dr. Summerall told us about one story where a man is lying on a stretcher, dying, has this huge tumor in his stomach. The family brought the man on a stretcher. The doctor is even with him. And Wigglesworth walks over and says, Hootsup. 
And they tell him, he looks at him and then draws back, punches the man. And the man looks like he dies, just <laughs> drops. Wigglesworth never, I mean, never bad an eye, just bam, walks off. The doctor jumps up, runs behind him, starts screaming, you brute, you've killed him, you brute, you've killed him. The family will sue you. And he's chasing Wigglesworth. Wigglesworth is walking. Wigglesworth stops and turns and the doctor almost is right in his face. And he goes, don't tell me my business. I know my business. Turned around and walked off. While he was walking off, the man on the stretcher ran past them all, totally healed. <laughs> now, two things about that. This is a problem. Number one, people don't know where that came from. What they don't know is that when Wigglesworth was younger, in his younger days, he developed appendicitis. He was lying in bed. Doctor said he was going to die. A young man and a woman came to his house, heard about the situation, went to his bed, said, we hear that you're dying. He said, yep. And the young man jumped on the bed, punched him in the stomach, and he was instantly healed. So guess what? All he ever did was do what worked for him. He never heard God say, punch this person, punch that person. No, he found a method that worked for him. And when you find a method that'll work for you, you can use that method and release your faith in that method and it will work for you. Now, second part, don't tell me my business. I know my business. I'm amazed at the number of people that will stand in a healing line and tell me how to get them healed. I'm amazed. And they all got the idea of how it's going to be. And I'm like, well, if you're so, know so much, why ain't you healed? Why are you standing in my line? Why? And then people get upset if you get a little rough with them. Now, I've never punched anybody. Not saying I didn't want to. But that anointing seems to come over you more with family than it does others. I'm just saying that. Okay. Just, but, but listen, God is so big. And just as our sister was saying earlier, he, he, he wants you to have so much more of him in your life. But to have it, he, listen, he gives you himself, but he get, you let him in as much as you let him in. If you got 10 rooms in your life and you only open one, you can't tell him, oh, more, Lord, more, Lord. He's, listen, that's what he's saying to you. More. Open up those other rooms. I'll come right in. I'm knocking. You open the door. I'll come in. He's not the one holding back. We don't have to beg him to, to show up and to come into us. All we got to do is open ourselves up to him and say, yeah, I know this is going to be, it ain't going to be fun, but I'm going to open this door. And you clean that up. And he will come right on in. And he'll clean it up. And then he'll find the next room with a, with a locked door. And he'll keep going through all of it. Now, the main emphasis that I want to get to today, because I'm going to have to hurry here, I guess. Yeah. I don't know when to stop. Y'all just tell me. Oh, I got two minutes. Okay. <laughs> so now I'm starting my sermon. Now. <laughs> But you know these verses, all right? So let's, let's go through them real quick here. Isaiah, go to Isaiah. Isaiah 55. Now, I don't know how to say this without... I want to I say it, but I know I don't really mean it. But I kind of mean it. And what I mean by that is... This is life. This is life. It reveals the life you have. See, I, I don't do sermons. I share what I've learned. I share what I've seen work. And when you do that, it, it, it's not easy to turn it on and turn it off. I don't preach messages like that. I mean, there's points and there's things that we need to get to and that kind of stuff. But you have to understand... This is where I live. This is life. If, I, if I'm standing here talking to you or sitting in a restaurant and we're talking, this is life. And then people say, oh, you know, you're so blessed. You know, you walk in divine health. Listen, God doesn't 
help me walk in divine health without my cooperation. So it's not that he just dumped it on me. I've learned that his word is life if I find it and health to all my flesh. His word. See, that's what people don't get. They think, that's just ink on paper. And that's why you'll never realize the benefit of it. Because you think it's just ink on paper. It's not. This is the DNA of Jesus. This is who he is. It's who he wants to be with you. I got news for you. This is who you are. Why? Because James said, if you look in a mirror, what do you see? He said, if you're a hearer of the word and not a doer, you become a forgetful hearer. If you look in the mirror and you walk away, you'll forget what type of person you are. Well, when you look in the mirror, you see yourself. But he said, when you look in here, you find out who you are. So when you look in here, you're looking in a mirror. So this is telling you who you are. And guess what? It, you say, well, I thought you said it was Jesus' DNA. Yeah, why? Because you and he are one. Amen. You're joined together as one. People shouldn't be able to see where you stop and he starts. I've had people ask me before, well, Brother Curry, what do you think I ought to do about this? And I'll tell them. And they'll say, well, now, was that you or the Lord? I say, yes. <laughs> why? I'm not going to separate what he has joined together. Why? Because as soon as I separate it, then the devil can find me. I keep my life hid in him. My sister-in-law, who is a heathen, goes to, used to go to psychics and stuff. And she went to one one time and the psychic, she said, because she was always trying, she was in multi-level marketing and all kinds of stuff, every kind of business, and very successful. And she was always trying to get me involved in her stuff. And she, she, I told her, I said, I, I don't want to do that. I, I have nothing in that. I don't want to do it. So, and, and we were broke. And she couldn't understand why I didn't want to get involved in her stuff. But my heart wasn't in it. I, that wasn't what I could do. And so she went to this psychic, apparently a very well-known one in Los Angeles. And it was a man. And she went to the psychic and said, can you tell me something about my brother-in-law? Because he's like this boat tied to the dock with the engine running full throttle. But he's just tied the dock. Okay? And she goes, can you tell me anything? So this, okay, the Bible calls them peepers and mutterers. Okay? So he did his peeping and muttering, right? And he looks at her and he goes, I can't tell you anything about him. He said, because every time I try, all I see is this big cross. And she comes back and tells me that. And I look at it and I said, well, you got a real one this time. <laughs> Why? And she said, what do you mean? I said, because the Bible tells me my life is hid in Christ. Now, see, here's the problem. Our life stays hid. How do we get unhid? Because, see, the devil can't find you to put anything on you if you keep your life hid. So how does he find you to put stuff on you? I'll tell you how he finds you. When you pull open Jesus, you stick your head out and you go, my ministry, my gift, my call, my, 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 my. Because it's not yours. It's his. And then when you put, and see, as soon as you pull him open and you stick your head out because you want to be somebody or you want a name or something, the devil goes, there you are. And that's when he comes over to start slapping you around. So the key is to stay hid. Just stay hid. Amen? Amen. I know I didn't get far in this. I know I got to stop. I'll, I'll give you the, the cliff notes, okay? I don't even know if they're still around anymore. Anyway, okay. Here's what he says. In Isaiah 55, let me run through it. Uh, Isaiah 55, verse 10. For as the rain... Now I'm going to go back to verse 9. Now I'm going to go back to verse 8. Sorry about that. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. You ever heard that before? Yeah. yeah, in church, right? Yeah. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, you have to go back and read all of this. He's not talking to the righteous. 
He's talking to the wicked. And yet I hear Christians quite, well, but you know, the Lord's thoughts are, you know, we just don't know. We don't know because his thoughts are above our thoughts, his ways above our ways. And, I, and I'm like, no, no, no. Okay. What that tells me is you need to get saved because I have the mind of Christ. And if I have the mind of Christ, his thoughts are not above my thoughts. See, that's why he tells me to have my mind renewed to the word of God. If I get my mind renewed to the word of God, his thoughts become my thoughts. You understand that? Now, see, people don't like this. Religious people don't like this. They like the mystical in-between that you can't put your finger on. Why? Because then anybody can do anything, say anything, and nobody can say anything about it. That's why the prophetic gift is the most abused and misused gift in the body of Christ. And so, but here he said, now watch. He said, let the wicked return. He said, why wicked? Because wicked, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. But then he says, let them return. Then he says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. For as the rain comes down from heaven and snow, or down and snow from heaven and returns not thither, but waters the earth, makes it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be. That goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. Now, here's the bottom line. Notice what he just said. My word that goes out of my mouth cannot return to me void, but it has to accomplish what I send it to do. Is that right? So let's get this. Let me be clear. So God's word cannot go back to him once he puts it out. It cannot go back until it has accomplished what he sent it to do. Is that right? So no word of God has ever returned to him without finishing what he was sent to do. Can we say that? Do you believe that? Okay, John chapter one, verse 14. You don't have to turn there. You should probably, just because I don't want you to take my word for it, but write down a note, check it out later. Okay, we don't have time to stay here. But in John chapter one, verse 14, it says, then we know in verse John chapter one and one, he says that in the beginning was the word and words with God and the word was God. Isn't that right? And in verse 14, he tells us that the word was made flesh and dwelt among man. Jesus said, my father sent me. Isn't that right? He said, as my father sent me, I send you. Now, now get this. So Jesus was the word. Is that right? Is Jesus the word? So Jesus was the word and the word was made flesh. And the word was sent from God. So the word came from God was made flesh, did everything he did. I'm, I'm cutting this really short, but did everything he did on earth. Now, get this. Then he went to the whipping post. Is that right? Yeah. And there he bore our stripes for our healing, right? Yeah. Then he went to the cross where he shed his blood for our sins so we could be forgiven. Is that right? Yeah. So now he did all that. And then, now he's not going to do anything after that yeah. from the cross. Is that right? So what did he say at the end there? It is finished. What does that mean? That means, now get this, that means that the word accomplished what it was sent to do because he, the word, could not return to God until he accomplished all that he sent and he prospered in the thing whereunto he sent it. So if Jesus returned to the Father, Everything is done. Amen? Do you get that? See, when you understand that, now it's, it's done. He said, it's finished. I, I, I finished that part. Now, he's not going to come do it again. He's not going to go to the whipping post again for your healing. He's already went. And he's accomplished it. Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent his word and healed them. Isn't that something? So now we know one thing for sure that the word was sent to do. The word was sent for your healing. And he accomplished that at the whipping post 2,000 years ago. And all he's doing now is waiting for you to receive it or for somebody to give it to you. Amen? Does that make sense? He sent his word and accomplished his will. Now I've got 20 scriptures that we could go through to go over and over. How many times he said, the father sent me, the, the one that the father has sent, and I'm, I come to do his will, everything. You can tie it all together. It's amazing. It's, uh, I'm telling you, the Bible is amazing. You have to read it sometime. It's something else. 
I mean, you, it, you'll stay in there for hours. I see people, listen, I always tell people, you want to go to sleep at night? And I've always heard that, you know, you want to go to sleep? Read the Bible, it'll put you to sleep. Wrong. You know, I read the Bible just, which I always do, just for, I can lay there for hours. And that means that, and it goes with that, and, it goes with that. and then the light comes back on, and then I'm going through it again. Why? Because it's life. Life doesn't shrink, it grows. Amen? His word is life. And it's for anybody. Anybody that you hear or listen to or anything like that, the only reason you listen to them is because they have believed that that word is life and they have believed that and it's become life in them. And because of that, their light, their light shine and that light drew you. That's why you listen to them. So I'm telling you, listen, I, I don't have time to go into everything. I want to so bad. I want to so, just to pour it out. Because why? Because God needs you. You understand? He doesn't need you as though he's not going to exist if you don't do so. I'm saying, he, we're his hands. We're his feet. We can do what he told us to do. But you have to decide to believe it. And, and we ought to be first partakers of what we proclaim. So I'm not saying you can't minister to somebody if you're sick. I'm saying, though, that we should not even be candidates for healing. We're the purveyors of healing. We're the distributors of healing. But if we can keep the army sick, then the army can't march. And we have to remember, he is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Exodus 15, 3 and 15, 26 even tells you that I'm the Lord that heals thee. He's a warrior. That's his nature. Two kingdoms and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Guess what? That means fight. You are told to fight the good fight of faith. You are told to resist the devil and he will flee. And that good fight sometimes, most of the time, is you resisting. And that resisting is you standing and saying, no, the word says. It is written. Not brother so-and-so said. It is written. You've got to develop a reputation in hell. That's what they did in the book of Acts, the seven sons of Sceva. They go in. Oh, we adjure thee by Jesus Christ, whom Paul preaches, to come out. And that demon spoke up. Jesus I know. Paul I know. Who are you? They didn't have a reputation in hell. Paul and Jesus had a reputation in hell. What does that mean? That means when Paul woke up, hell started sounding alarms. Eh, eh, eh. He's up. Everybody hide. Just stay quiet. Maybe he won't know you're there. Why? Because if he sees you, you're out of there. You've got to realize who you are. You're not you. Do you understand that? You're not the you you used to be. And the new you is just like him. Because as he is, so are we in this world, not the next one. We are of the tribe, of the, of the line of the tribe of Judah. We are him on this earth. Do you understand that? That's who you are. But you've got to decide that you're going to stand up. If you're sick, you've got to decide, no, no more. I'm done. You've got to get fed up. Now, we can give it to you, and I can tell you, how do, how do kings rule? Do they make a declaration and then go out? And I, I want to I ditch Doug. I declare a ditch shall be dug. Do they go out and grab a shovel? No. How do they get their will done? They speak. And we are kings and priests under our God. How do we get his will done? You speak. Amen. Why? Because where the word of a king is, there is power. So today, right now, now I've already ministered to some of you, but now we're going to let Jesus minister to the rest of you, and we're going to do it the way a king would do it, and we're going to decree and declare, and I'm going to speak to you right now, and if you will hear the voice of God in it, angels hearken to the voice of the word of God. They don't hearken to the word of God. They hearken to the voice. If they hearken to the word, it all be done. But they're waiting for a voice. That voice is you. Yeah. 
you become that voice. And you speak as the oracles of God. You speak for him. Amen? And then he backs you up. Why? Because we are here in his stead. So based on the word of God, based on the authority of the word of God, based on the truth of the word of God, I'm saying to you now, if you are sick in your body and you came here, don't come here expecting me to minister to you the way you think it should be done. I know my business. Amen? So I'm telling you now, just decide right now. Get ready. Get ready to receive. Amen? Just get ready. I'm just giving you a second. Just make a decision. I'm receiving what I came for. I'm receiving my healing. I'm receiving my deliverance. I'm receiving it. And as soon as my brother speaks, I'm going to receive. Why? Because I'm fixing to speak. And if you'll receive, you'll have it. Amen? So right now, in the name of Jesus, sickness and disease, you have no right here at all. Sickness and disease, demonic spirits, entities, I command you now in the name of Jesus, you will hear and obey the voice of the word of God. The word of God has spoken and said that Jesus healed all that had need of healing. That Jesus healed them all. It says in Acts chapter 5 that the disciples healed them all. So now, sickness and disease... You hear and obey. The time for all has come. So right now in the name of Jesus, I don't care what system of your body has been sick or, or in ailment of any sort. I'm telling you now, it has no more right, no more authority, never had the authority. And I'm telling you now, it will obey the voice of the word of God. And so right now in the name of Jesus, sickness, disease, cancer, Leukemia, blood pressure, tumors, cataracts, ears. Right now, in the name of Jesus, you will hear and obey. Right now, be healed. Be made whole. Now, in Jesus' name, we forbid you to remain the same. We forbid sickness and disease to remain. You did not buy these bodies. Jesus Christ did. They belong to him. Now you are evicted. You will go now in Jesus' name. And I don't mean maybe. It will be this way and no other. So right now in the name of Jesus, those under the sound of my voice, those watching even by internet or any other system, those hearing this a year from now, I'm telling you now, the word of God is alive Receive it now in Jesus' name. Whatever you could not do, begin to do. If you couldn't stand, stand. If you couldn't move, move. If you couldn't breathe, breathe deep. If you couldn't see, close one eye, look out the other, check your ears, whatever it was you couldn't do, whatever it was you couldn't do, right now, faith comes with the word. It's here. Be healed. Now, just begin doing, begin moving. Right? Now, even now, pain has to also go. It cannot remain. No need for pain if everything's fixed. Amen? Do it quick. We ain't got much time. Jesus works quick. Immediately, it says. Amen? Begin to move. Begin to move. Even now. Begin to move. There you go. Start moving. That's it. That's it. There you go. Now, as you see things taking place in your body, just begin to worship him. Just begin to thank him. If you see an inch of deliverance, begin to thank and watch the rest come. Begin to thank him. Begin to worship him. He's the healer. We're just the mouthpieces. There you go. Just begin, just begin to thank him. Begin to worship him. Even now, thank him for what he's doing in your body. Thank him for what he's doing in your mind. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Quick. Even now in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. We bless your people. Father, we thank you even now for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you that they will hear and know and be open to hearing your word straight from you in Jesus' name. So be it. Amen. Amen. My brother. Amen. Thank you, my brother. So great. Would you stand to your feet today? Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Those of you on the internet, again, thank you so much for joining us today for this healing now. We agree with you, and I know that uh, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Uh, let us know what God is doing there where you are. We want to hear, and it's going to encourage so many other people as a result. And again, those of you who have joined us here in the auditorium today, we are so thankful for you coming and taking uh, this Wednesday afternoon to be a part of what God is doing. Have you been blessed today? Yeah. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise one more time. Would you quickly join somebody's hand next to you right now? In the name of Jesus, Father, I just thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you that you have joined us together for such a time as this. Thank you, Lord God, that we are not alone. We are not lone wolves. We're not by ourselves, Lord God. But that you have called us together and to be standing with one another. Thank you, Father, that those on our left and on our right, behind us, in front of us, are blessed to be a blessing. And Lord God, you have joined us together to be of one heart and one mind, the mind of Christ, and one voice. And Father, we thank you that in our generation today, we are not going to stay silent. Hallelujah. We are going to uh, rise up and we are going to speak up. We're going to stand upon every promise that's already yes and amen. We're going to stand up on every word of the Lord. And we thank you today, Lord God, that you have called us together to be in this and of this in Jesus' name. Lord, we give you all the thanks and praise today. Can we just take a minute and lift up our hands now and just tell the Lord, thank you for your goodness in our lives. Thank you, Lord God, for the word of God that's alive and powerful. Thank you that you are working on our behalf, Lord God, that you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, we say, blessed be your name. Thank you, Lord God, for your victory is our victory. Your triumph is our triumph. And we bless you and thank you for who you are in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite our healing disciples that are scheduled for the front here to come on up. And uh, we want to give you an opportunity uh, for hands being laid on you. If you want some further ministry, uh, we are here to be able to help you with that and it would be our honor and blessing to do so so if you'd like further ministry make your way out of your rows into the aisle and our ushers will help direct you if that's not you you are dismissed thank you so much for being a part of our healing now today and those of you online again thank you for joining us we look forward to being together again next wednesday lord willing uh, pastor greg moore is going to be with us next week and i know you're going to be blessed god bless you